The types want to initiate you. They have a message. And the message is, you can do what we are doing. And what they're doing is using their voices to make physical objects condense out of the air. And they're saying, you can do this. Do it. Do it. Do it. And they're on you. And they, they jump in and out of your chest. They jump in and out of your chest. And they are saying, do this thing. Do it. Do it. Suspend your belief. And eventually you do do it. And these things have a, a very, the aura of strangeness, of alienness is palpable. There's an emotion in there that we just don't have in this world because it's composed of unbelievable alienness in the presence of unbe unbelievable familiarity. It was the presence of the entities that shattered the person who I was because I was a scientific rationalist, a reductionist. I had no, no room for elves in my cosmology. <laughs> and here they were, hundreds of them. But this is the question that must be asked. Who's in there? Who is this? There are at least three possibilities. And I'm not sure which is the most conservative. The first possibility is that um, we don't understand how the world is constructed and that in fact there is a parallel universe running alongside of ours uh, full of elves who use a language to make objects and then why you can burst through to this place on this one drug you know then that raises each explanation raises a lot of questions uh, then the other possibility this is the Jungian possibility. He talks about these elves. He describes them as autonomous psychic elements that have escaped from the control of the ego. It means that the psyche is to be visualized as elves. Another possibility, and one I leaned toward for years, and I still lean toward, because I've noticed the radical nature of your explanation uh, diminishes with the distance since the last time you smoked a DMT. Uh, the longer it's been, the more likely you are to have some humdrum notion that you can pour it into. So the humdrum notion that I settled on was, well, clearly these are just extraterrestrials. <laughs> this is, they don't come in silver ships demanding to be taken to the National Defense Agency. This is how they come. Why they come this way, who knows? They're coming through mind. Mind is the medium in which they travel. Where do they come from? Who knows? Can it even be located in the Newtonian space-time matrix? I mean, what do you want here? A star catalog number? Would that satisfy you? And then finally, and I think I've exceeded my number of possible explanations, um, <laughs> And then finally, the explanation, which is my current favorite, it dis it's a little disturbing. Um, and I haven't quite figured out what to do with it, but I have a sense we're on the right track here. The reason the DMT space feels so peculiar, both alien and excruciatingly uh, uh, familiar, is uh, because these things in this other place represent what I call an ecology of souls. This place is the one place you never thought you were going to make a visit to and come back to chat it around the coffee maker. This, they're dead. That's who these things are. This is the realm of the dead. Well, I have to confess, in all of my psychedelic voyaging and idea mongering and all of that, I never was able to go that far, to reach that far in my imagination. It sort of had to be presented to me. But if you go to shamans worldwide and talk to them about their spirit helpers and say, you know, what's the deal with this? You know, who are these things? They say, well, these are the ancestors. Didn't you know these are the ancestors? It's 
perfectly cut and dried and normal. I mean, I mean, this is absolutely forbidden by the modern world view, uh, and yet it lies very, very close to the surface in our culture. Terence McKenna gave us four examples of what he thought those entities were, are. And he says he thinks he talked about all possibilities, but he clearly and most obviously ignored the one that jumps out to me. Because the one that jumps out to me are entities that have actually jumped out from their dimension into my dimension. And I've seen firsthand witness of demonic entities move objects, poltergeist demons. It's interesting he talks about Carl Jung and his psychology and the psyche of the mind. Carl Jung was obsessed with that. That was his profession, to be a psychologist, a psychiatrist, and just study the mind. Best friends with Sigmund Freud, who did the same thing. And it, it is the most common thing someone that takes drugs is going to jump to. Oh, it's just in your mind. It's just in your mind, man. It's just, uh, it's just your mind reacting to the chemicals you're putting in there and crazy dreams crazy trips lucid dreams are taking place on an accelerated level because of the drugs now most definitely that can be one of the cases and scientifically is but what terence mckenna said is it's repeatable you always see elves and gnomes over and over and over if you take a certain amount of this that and the other I do not condone drugs, I've never taken drugs, but I can say this, as a stone-cold, sober individual, I've witnessed demonic entities move objects in my room many times, specifically 2010, 2011, few and far between after that. We're talking very little in the years after that, but... 2018 would have been the last significant thing that happened to me. But these mind experimenters who take these substances to experiment on their own mind, it's a risky business, but Terence McKenna definitely was a pioneer on exploring the mind, describing it eloquently, what he saw. Most people that take these substances cannot eloquently describe anything. They just say, whoa, it was hard to describe, man. So... He definitely did thoughtfully think and consider. He said, maybe they're elves in a parallel universe. He said, maybe they're of the mind, of the psyche. He said, maybe they're aliens. Maybe they're extraterrestrials. And then he said, maybe they're souls of the dead. But he left out the one obvious thing that jumps out to me. The fifth possibility, which I would reverse and make it the first possibility. Demon spirits. Demon spirits, they're not always going to appear to you with horns and a pitchfork and put up a front of evil. The most slippery, the most insidious of demon spirits are going to appear as something beautiful and wonderful, an ascended master of pure love and light and peace. Yes, they can reproduce and mimic all of that. They're not going to come with a pitchfork and just start poking you unless you know what they are. And perhaps they will do that. But that's the less common. When you take drugs, from what I've heard from many other cases, Terrence McKenna being one of them, you're met and greeted with beautiful, peaceful elves and gnomes. These creatures want to initiate you. Let's focus on this initiation. Initiation is one of the most common threads in the occult world of books in the past thousands of years. Initiation is key. Initiation is always what they want from you. They want to initiate you. They want to give you a rank. They want to say you're the Grand Hierophant of the excelsior degrees spectacular fabulous amazing of the order of the 12 triangles i just made that up all right it's just an example 
They want to give you a fake title, a fake bogus title, but Terrence McKenna specifically said they asked him to just make objects using the same way they make objects with their mind, with their words. They say things and objects materialize. I do believe this is very possible in an ethereal dimension where these demons live. They can most definitely make objects, but they're not physical objects. They fade away into nothingness. I've talked about this and I've heard about this and read about this many times, that there is a astral plane where nothing is solid except for the entities. It seems the buildings shape shift either geometrically, fractally, disappear or build themselves everything that's a physical object seems to fade in and out of existence shapeshift and be malleable by the mind and of the words of the entities there like a dream an actual dimension that's kind of like a lucid dream so instead of it being just a lucid dream it's an actual dimension and nothing is real except for the entities the entities are as real as real can be. When everything fades away, the entities are still there. But they like to dress up the place. They like to build up the sets like a movie set. They like to put on the, the costumes. Some of these demons will make the most elaborate scale armor, the most elaborate robes and dresses, garments that don't exist. When you can create it with your mind and your words, the sky's the limit. Your imagination is literally the limit in this dimension. I do believe this dimension exists. I think everything that is woven and created by these entities is an illusion. So it's literally a dimension of illusion, except for the entities. They're the only thing that are not illusion. They're actually trapped there or they're stuck there. We can see them. Why... Can you see them when you take a substance such as DMT? I've never taken it. I never will. But I do believe, for one reason or another, it mimics the death process, perhaps. And if you're reproducing, mimicking the death process, perhaps you can find a loophole and supersede death to get a glimpse of one dimension above us. So you're not actually going to see the land of the dead, which Terence McKenna settled on. That was his final... After Aliens, he settled on it, them being the dead. After hearing Shaman tell him, they take shamanistic drugs, they've done it for thousands of years, they consider them the ancestors. And different cultures are going to consider demons ancestors. Different cultures are going to consider demons entities of intelligence that bring light and wisdom. I personally don't trust demons because they harassed me and bothered me. They've only caused me pain, anguish, and they definitely haven't helped me in any way, shape, or form that I know of, uh, except build me up to be stronger against them. So it, it, there's not much logical reason you could give them any benefit of the doubt when the only thing they've helped you with is to not be too afraid of them. It's like being abducted by aliens a thousand times. On the thousandth time, you'll be a lot less scared than the first time. That's an analogy I can give you on how I approach demons. They're still evil, menacing, but when they show up, I'm not scared anymore. But they're still real. They still exist. They've externally moved objects. They've set off many of my ghost investigation equipment devices on camera. Multiple cameras, multiple angles. It's a risky thing. I don't recommend it. But Terrence McKenna, pioneer of the mind, of a dangerous substance. I did listen to him on at least two occasions live, on two interviews. I wasn't the typical teenager. Back in the early, mid, and late 90s, I did listen to Art Bell live regularly. I would stay up and listen to it. My parents got me hooked, and I did listen to two live interviews between Art Bell and Terrence McKenna. I remember the first time I heard him, I was like, wow, this is interesting. I've never heard, I didn't know 
you could see such visions on drugs. I, I had a generic perspective of it. I had a perspective of hippies, you know, they see like a kaleidoscope and then they pass out. I had no concept of what a drug trip was like until Terence really eloquently described it. And then Art had him back on, and he definitely is a fascinating character, but he obviously didn't believe in demon spirits. It's a very scary subject. Even the possibility of them being dead, the souls of the dead in the world of the dead, was scary to Terrence McKenna. Uh, he didn't even want to approach the scariest possibility. He never even mentioned it. Demon spirits. Pretty freaky stuff. But when he said they tried to initiate him and they jumped on his stomach, you can see my slideshow of these paintings. It was definitely something the artist grabbed from reality. I've witnessed in my mind's eye an entity similar to this, except it was pitch black, all black, and it had long hair. So what I saw was an entity, at least, it jumped on top of me, it was on my chest, and sometimes they're on your stomach. I can tell you this, the most common place a demon is going to be physically on you is going to be on your chest, on your stomach, and perhaps the back of your skull, where your spine connects to your skull. Those would be the three most obvious places a demon is going to try to latch on to you or try to physically pressure you, and you can feel it. It's a scary thing, but the fact that Terrence McKenna didn't connect the dots on that means he hadn't experienced it outside of the trips. It goes beyond sleep paralysis. I've felt spirits jump on my chest. I thought it was a dream. I woke up. It, the entity's still on my chest. It literally took 30 seconds to a minute for the entity to jump off my chest. It felt like a cat jumping off my chest. So in that instance, it did feel like the weight of the spirit itself manifested as about the weight of a cat. Pretty freaky when it's invisible and not in a dream and you wake up and it's still there. Pretty freaky. So I do believe in sleep paralysis, but I believe in false sleep paralysis. These illusion master demons can reproduce. I'm hearing some crazy stuff in the microphone. Too bad, so sad. I can't have a conversation with negative entities because... I'm focused on analyzing Terrence McKenna's perspective on the entities he experienced while on DMT, among other substances. And I do believe you can have visions given you from demonic entities while you take substances that shamans definitely have used for thousands of years. And then we have the synthetic versions, which really are much more potent and they can give you an extreme trip and some people have described it as changing their lives and being a spiritual experience but if you don't know the entities if you don't know anything about the entities if you're quite frankly just blocking out the possibility that these are demons if you don't even want to consider that they're demons you're gonna accept the information some people could do good with it but there is a negative aspect, there's a dark side to it. You could become addicted to it, you could become an ambassador of these ascended masters, and when you're an ambassador, they initiated you. You're part of the order now. They will give you instructions. They've never helped humanity. If these entities were legitimately ascended masters that wanted to save the human race, they would have given us something useful by now. They always give you something vague. It's always bullcrap. It's always, oh, yeah. don't eat meat. Oh, yeah. save the rainforest. It's always super, super, super generic. It's not something a million-year-old entity would be giving as a gift. Don't eat meat and save the rainforest? That's a bumper sticker that anyone 
has already heard and come up with. That's not going to change the world and never has and never will. So until these entities give us something useful, I consider them all tricksters. Trickster demons. They know who I am, I know who they are, and I guarantee you they're listening in. Carl Jung did see visions, and he said he was of the mind. The internal visions that they give you is a mask, a facade. It's fake. It's an illusion. It's smoke and mirrors. When you take that away, it's an evil entity that can, like a chameleon, change a million shapes a million ways, appear a million ways, until they find that one way that they know you're going to accept, know you're going to love, know you're going to glorify them and give them credit, give them what they really want. They want recognition. They want glory. They want your attention. They want power. They want you to be controlled. And it's pretty hard to control these entities. I don't even attempt to control them. I don't attempt to banish them. I just say, this is my location. Go back to your location. Depart. Not interested in you bothering me. Leave me alone. I try to keep it as low-key as possible. Demons are like lawyers. They'll always look for that legal reason to be there. And if you take DMT, bam, you've just given them a legal reason to be there. Whether you think DMT is good or bad, these entities consider when a human takes it to be legal grounds to harass you. Now, I'm hearing a lot of static feedback. Perhaps it's opposition. But I'm speaking the truth. When you take illegal substances, unless it's for the betterment, most definitely a lot of people suffer from illnesses. I'm ta talking about recreational stuff or taking a gamble with your brain cells. When you gamble with your brain cells and you take some harsh substance that you know in your own gut that maybe you shouldn't take it too much in excess. It gives legal ground for these entities to basically jump on your chest, jump on your stomach, jump on the back of your skull, where the spine connects to your skull, and they can definitely give you visions. They can give you visions, whether you're wide awake, whether you're sleeping, or whether you're on a certain drug. Here is a list of books with the word initiate or initiation in the title. Initiation is an extremely common thread in the occult. It's something Terence McKenna, I have to assume, wasn't too aware of. He had his own study of research. As far as my study of research, it goes beyond ghost investigating. It goes into the realm of buying $3,000 worth of occult books and researching millions of dollars of occult books I haven't purchased. And with this age of information, you can download a lot of free PDFs. I've downloaded a good thousand PDFs of different occult books here and there. And initiation is key. It comes up time and time again, whether it's Manley P. Hall, Rudolf Steiner, Blavatsky, you name it. Across the board, all occultists are familiar with the term initiation, initiates. I have the book Initiates of the Flame by Manley P. Hall. I had The Way of Initiation by Rudolf Steiner. Initiation is a process between a human and a spirit. That's pretty much the most simplistic gist of what it is. And it is what Terence McKenna talked about. These gnomes, these elves, these fairies, very innocent, childlike. He called them tykes. He called them machine elves. They just wanted to initiate him so he can do what they do. I wouldn't be interested in doing what they do. The physical world is more important than the smoke and mirrors world any day of the week. But there is a spiritual world above that smoke and mirrors illusion astral plane that is of true spirituality that cannot be reached by simply ingesting a drug. There is a spiritual world above 
that can't be entered by the living taking a drug. So it's almost as if this astral plane of illusion is a mockery of the true spiritual realm above. So I do believe the true spiritual realm above, perhaps the sixth, seventh, or eighth dimension, we don't know, is equally important as this physical world. I say 50-50. And most definitely this demon dimension of smoke and mirrors has some importance. It has its place. But it's not the afterlife. Until next time, I thank you for listening. This has been John Rasmus with Mysterialis Ghost Investigation. Be seeing you.